Lengthy winters. Another. Uh, these are. You're going to see a lot of my favorite pictures that I put in here. Um, the kid with this, <laughs> this ski mask. Yeah, this looks definitely. Doesn't this look like it's a 20 below day or more? Definitely a 20 below day. I think they had cold. <laughs> Maybe they did. Um, spring comes to be later than in many places. I think we're, we're still in spring here, maybe. Um, as the days grow longer, children and adults alike are ready to enjoy more daylight, warmer temperatures, and melting snow. Um, did, do any of y'all remember doing a Mayhole dance? Because that's something that's not in my generation. Anybody? This is probably from, I'd say 1920 or so, which is before you all as well. So that tradition is obviously died, died down. And then summer. Doesn't that, that looks like it could be in Butte or Brooklyn, New York, or Chicago, doesn't it? But that's here, that's here in Butte. It was right out in front. Running through the fire hose. Was that right out here in front? There, yeah, you're right. Murray, Murray Clinic and the. You're right. The there's yeah. Oh, there's wow. the. Um, the Murray Hospital. The O'Rourke, the Murray Murray Clinic. So the fire fire hall where we're sitting is over here. Yeah. In the picture. I don't know the fireman. That's a 1950 student. 1950. All right, that's how we date a lot of our pictures. Is by the cars, cars and hats. Swimming at Gregson Hot Springs. <laughs> Camping, fishing, and this is one of those pictures that you could take now and it would look almost exactly the same 100 years later. Picnicking, probably at the Thompson Park, maybe. Uh, Butte's proximity to mountains, forests, and streams provides us ample opportunities to explore all of those activities. And I think that's, I'll, I'll put my little political spin in here. I think that's one of the greatest thing about living in VA is the access to the public lands around here. <coughs> Fishing in the river. Uh, I don't know if this is the Jefferson or could be, I don't think it's the big hole. Kind of feels like the Jeff, I don't know. Summer, roller skating, um, cowboy swings, soapbox derbies. Anybody do soapbox derby? Any y'all do soapbox derby? Did you Before that we got in, but I used to go to that all the time. Yeah, I it was a school of mine. Yeah, it's a big thing. And then fall, we got the monkey bars again. So this is an interesting picture. Did you get the playground? I think, because I was just up there that weekend, I think this is the Lexington. It, it is. Is that the Lexington? Am I right? Yeah. Uh, 
So, yeah, that's not a toxic playground at all. <laughs> Where's Main Street, if that's all right? Uh, it the other side, the other the other side, side of, of the building. This is looking east. So Main Street is on the other side of the building. Oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah. And Daly Street is coming yeah. up. About where I am right here. That's the slide that's on the deck there. Is that the slide? The slide? Yeah. Aw. That's so cool. How many people burned their rear ends on slides in the summer? <laughs> I grew up in the 70s, and yes, I still remember that. Uh, I'm the last generation. Marbles and jump rope. I think if I remember, this is, yeah, it is. this is the Washington School. This is Fintown. Great, great picture. Um, Halloween parties. Did anybody go to the judge's Halloween parties? Yeah. Now we're going to get to the crux of our brown bag here. Um, talking about neighborhood play. Um, this, I, I think you, uh, Jim Newgren, you saw this picture. We were able to identify most of the kids in there. These are some Dublin Gulch kids. The Hogarth house right there. At the Hogarth house. I'm glad you said that, because I, I seriously was like, gosh, that looks a lot like my great-grandma's house. <laughs> I guess not. Children in Butte have always found creative ways to play in their own neighborhood. Streets, alleys, railroads, and mine tailings were default public play areas for Butte kids. They built forts with scrap wood from mine yards, played King of the Hill on the tailings, and shot marbles in the alleyways. The crossing of the B A M P Railroad at North Montana Street was, and this is from the newspaper, used notoriously as a resort for the children of the neighborhood. Dangerous play conditions finally led the city to consider more appropriate playgrounds equipped with slides, swings, and merry-go-rounds. Although children had been enjoying the equipment at Clark Park and the Columbia Gardens for decades, it wasn't until the 1910s and 1920s that the city took an active role to establish small parks throughout Butte. And uh, this, I think, is also up in Dublin Gulch. Looks like, I don't know if they got a baseball game going there. Could be. Looks like he's holding a stick. <laughs> he might be catching. And there's some kids spread around. And of course, they got a clown for the camera. But they're playing on the, on the tailings. Right there, yes. We used to do that, and we called it stick ball. Stick ball. Stick instead of a bat. Exactly, exactly. And this was also part um, of a national movement. Um, when society in general started focusing more towards children as children, you started to see in the teens and the 20s that they were not, in fact, miniature adults. And they needed places to play. And so it was kind of a national movement to um, start providing public playgrounds. Classic picture of a kid swinging on the mine tail and swinging on a pole. And I just noticed there's a maybe a little girl here. Looks like she might be wearing a dress. Yeah. Again, this might be in Dublin Gulch. Now we get, now we get to the crux of it. I'm going to introduce these guys. This is Jim Keane and Jim Newgren, and I'll give a little introduction, and then we'll go on. So Jim, Jim Newgren lives in his family home on Emma Street. The family's been in there since, what, 1908? 1900. 1900. When he was 12, he won the American Legion Poppy Poster Contest for the grad school. Do you remember that? Unless there was another Jim Newgren. There so was one other Jim Newgren there. There was. Then the Silver Walls. There was. So that, maybe he was the one that won the poppy contest. I don't remember me winning. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember who it was. He graduated from Butte Central in 1959 and was awarded a $500 scholarship at the School of Mines, where he served as the secretary treasurer of the freshman class. Now, lest you believe he was a totally fine and upstanding citizen, 
He was also prone later in life to speeding and running stop signs. Oh, no. <laughs> but in 1982, he caught a four pound rainbow trout at Tahibia Lake. Is that you or the other one? The what lake? Tahibia in the Pioneers? Oh, that was the other one. That was the other one. <laughs> <laughs> did you work for a, Did you work as a boiler maker? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> for, a <lot> <laughs> for a lot of years. I was president of the Boilermakers Union and Business Agency. <laughs> Did you teach an adult ed class in basic woodworking? Ed class, yes. All right. All right, I got the good points out. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to share a couple more good points. Jim Keen also grew up in the Farrell edition on Farrell Street, graduated from Boys Central one, one year behind Jim Uberin. When he was in the third grade, he ran his bicycle into an automobile. Do you remember that? Was it purposely? Yeah. <laughs> Twelve years later, he was ticketed for speeding in a school zone. Yeah. There you go. How did you find that? <laughs> we have all of the skeletons here, <laughs> and right on the other side of that wall. However, this miscreant held a good place on the honor roll, received an excellent education at several universities, and worked as an inst instructor at the Anaconda Job Corps, right? In the 1990s, he entered politics using the slogan, a keen brain in a middle-aged frame, <laughs> and served in both houses, uh, both the House and the Senate up in Helena. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to these two. There they are. <laughs> this, this is you, this is you, right? That's a house right behind you guys. There's you. It's my brother. So to get perspective, here's what mine is this? One of the head frames? That is the green copper mine. The green copper mine. And there's the new bro Doug Stein. Off in the distance. And uh oops. Can you go back? This is right behind my house. It's still there. Clappin's live there, and the little girl over there is Kay Clappin, who now lives down on the uh, corner of 2nd and Emma. And her brother ran Clappin's Corner for years, Joe Clappin. Oh, cool. And that's my brother. My brother and her were the same age. So, I. <laughs> So and that's after, we were. After you hear these stories, <laughs> you will understand why I called this slide. Lucky to have lived through childhood. So they're going to um, tell you, I'm going to put a, a map of the neighborhood up, and I'm going to let them tell you about the games that they played. And this, this is the park. The food bank is over here now. This is Second Street, going through here. Continental Drive, well not Continental, you know, to get to Continental is Shields. Shields is over here. So we've got Farrell, Second, and Emma, right there. All right, I'm going to give the mic to you guys, and the pointer. You guys can point and move, and I'm going to go sit down and film. And they're going to tell you about, about the game. Do you want to start with boxcar tag? No, I want to start no. with... Uh, He's bossy. <laughs> yeah, she lights me up to give a talk. And then she says, this is what you're going to talk about. This is <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. No, no, no. He gave me a list of what he's going to talk about. Yeah, I got a list here. And Jim and I were in most of this all white partners all the time. Because uh, my house is right up here. And Jim's... Jones was, where's Farrell? Right there. Yeah. Uh, there was his mother's house, and that was his grandfather's house. And he lived in both places. And uh, Dan, who lives, or lives, is sitting right there. Where you go, Jim? Uh-oh. Go back. There. And one more back. One more back. There you go. Okay. And she lived. On 3rd Street. On 3rd Street, let's see, coming no, up, go up, go up. Oh, yeah. I'm right up in there. Right she was, that was yours right up there, wasn't it? Yeah. 
The railroad was right behind. The railroad was right behind. It. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now her house is gone. And uh, Sarah's house. Yeah, she was related to the Sheras up here, who were up in this house. Yeah. And uh, that's all gone now too. That those were torn down. So they kind of because of this, uh, I get to see these people I haven't seen forever. <laughs> and a few more John Gillespie back there, and his wife, and Mr. Daly is my neighbor, and he lives in the house right next to ours. So, so anyway, who all lived in? Who all here lived in that neighborhood? Him. Oh, well, these, oh, and these people are about to introduce me. At your house, what you do? I mean, look. These, these ladies here are my sisters. <laughs> oh, I keep hitting the wrong one. Turn it off. Sorry. Hi. Right. Well, I gotta find it. I don't know what you did. I don't either. I thought I was seeing that. Yeah, we're having technical difficulties. Not for long. There we go. I blew my finger to this. So anyway, um, that's my sister Kathy, Lori, and Cindy. And yeah, my neighbor Jim. Well, when you no. There we go. There we go. So what we wanted to do, and the reason I wore my silly hat here from you Green School, pointer. and if you're in, you got a different point. Grace and you know, when you got the eighth grade back the then, you, everybody got it. Depending on the school they were in, we'll, we'll, like this. we'll get you one. I still have to have mine, so I dug it out to wear it, and that's about enough for that. Hat. <laughs> Oops. Anyway, we we're going to kind of start out. Jim and I were talking, like about organized sports, which were games, and that's what reminded me of uh, way back then. I was in uh, grade school, and all the public schools had football, basketball volleyball, track, and a bowling, which was called duck pins. I don't know if anybody remembers duck pins. Yeah, yeah see us. <laughs> he said that. And you had smaller pins, and the, the bowling ball didn't have holes, and it was about the size of a softball about. And there was two leagues, or one league, but there was two places you'd play at the, uh, over at YMCA. And they had a bowling alley there. And you'd play at the Avicon Employees Club, which is across the street from the Acoma on Broadway. And they had a bowling alley in there. So those are, those are the kind of games we played. And then other games, but I'm wearing my medal here for the first time in 70 years. <laughs> and in 1957, we were playing baseball. We had Little League. In fact, when we were in grade school, it was the first time Little League came to Butte. We were all tickled because we loved baseball. And it was a national thing, and we always thought, well, if we got good enough, we might end up in Cooperstown at the Nationals. And we never got out of Butte. But anyway, it was down the old Casey Street field, which is down on Casey Street, of course, below the Front Street uh, Railroad Station on the other side of the tracks. And that was the first place they played for a couple of years, and then they got down to uh, Father Sheen Park down there, Stodden Park. Anyway, so we had those those things. And anyway, later on, you got to go to Babe Ruth. That was when you got a little older, teenager. And in 1957, I was on the McQueen team. We went to the state tournament in Libby, and we came in second. I still got the medal. We lost to Glendive. <laughs> Jim, how did you get on the Queen team? Well, when you signed up back then for uh, Babe Ruth League, they kind of assigned you to a team, and I got McQueen. And then there was other teams, and there were ad sponsors and that. Like in Little League, the same thing. We played for Monitor Distributors, and I don't remember what they did. It was a company in town. Distributed something. I guess. Electrical supplies. Yeah. Was electrical supplies? Oh. <laughs> so you were assigned to teams, and, and when we did get to Little League, we actually got uniforms, and we were just tickled mm -hmm. because we had real baseball uniforms, cleats, and everything, not just a hat. 
So anyway, those were the, the, the games we played that were organized. And if you remember, public schools had like their own football league and we played all the time at Clark's Park. And Catholic schools had the CYO, the Catholic Youth Organization, was it? Yeah. So all the Catholic schools played there. But within each parish, there was a real rivalry, like our rivalry was with him at St. Joe's, we're at the Old Monroe. And uh, Emerson and St. John's, and I forget who was up at IC, that they, it all kind of worked out that wherever you had a public school, you had a Catholic school. There's lots of great schools. So those were kind of the organized uh, things that we had. Then we got into the crazy stuff with this guy. <laughs> uh, so so we'll, we'll work the, the neighborhood, and I'm sure people from other neighborhood had, had different things. And, and to me, what I wanted to start out with is, uh, and I, 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 I've thought about this, and I think if you think about it in your own life, growing up in Butte as young, you, you were as free as I felt as free as I've ever felt in my life because what the parents didn't want you in the house. They fed you, go out and play, come back at dinner time at five o'clock and eat dinner and leave again. And they either come back, there were two things sometimes come in when the arc lights go on or when the siren blows. Yeah. That was the assignment you were given to go play. So before we were in organized sports, you, there was this mass of kids in every neighborhood. You had the free days at the Columbia Gardens, which is Chief Tracy's doing a great job about. But in your own neighborhoods, as young kids, you had to create your own play. Now, we grew up, as described in the map, between two railroads, the uh, uh, Great Northern, full of, full of trains all the time, and the Northern Pacific, which was a... Uh, Union Pacific was on. But, uh, and with Union Pacific was on the end, but the Northern Pacific came in. Uh, oh, okay. yeah, Great yeah. Northern was up yeah, Great Northern. So you had two railroads in between where we lived in the neighborhood, and you were real close to the Northern, uh, the Great Northern was the one. So we want to start off with some of the railroad play that we would. So when we were young, we had created a, what was called a boxcar tag. And you got on the top of the boxcars, and there was a kind of a ramp down there. You had to run down those boxcars and not get tagged. So you'd have to run off to the edge, and you know you didn't want to fall off the box car. So, so, and if you got tagged, then you were in. Were they moving? Pardon me. Were the were the trains moving? At no, the time no, they, they were. They, they weren't moving. Okay. <laughs> On the box cars, the refrigerated cars didn't have refrigerators. They had ice, and so they had walkways about this wide, and. That was safe to walk on, pretty safe anyway. But the <laughs> sides sloped and could get pretty slippery. Well, you couldn't just stay on the, the walkway because you'd get tagged. So we'd run off to the sides and go like a bat out of hell down the slippery side. Nobody ever fell off except his goofy brother. <laughs> He's going to get tagged and he comes to a, a break in the cars in as much as there was a gondola car there, and it was filled with some kind of sand or rock, but only half full. Well, Joe thinks he gets a good run, I can make it to this pile of dirt. No, he couldn't. <laughs> and he landed way down in the gondola car. I thought he broke both his legs. Didn't get hurt, though. I mean, it hurt. But he didn't get any permanent. <laughs> and, and, and we'll do Orange Crush next, and you can start on Orange Crush. Oh. Okay, we had Dingy Dan Sullivan. You guys know Saul. Dusty, he likes to be called. Dingy, we call him. <laughs> and we used to hang out at the bar on the corner. And it was... And how old were you hanging out at the bar? And not inside the bar. <laughs> oh, inside the bar, yes. Yeah. How old was I? How old were you guys? Okay, the first time... And I don't remember, but the first time I was told about hanging out in the bar, my goofy uncle, who I was named for, Jim Rogers, come to town. He was a career Marine, and this was in the Second World War. And my, he told my mom and dad, 
You guys deserve a night out. I'll babysit. Okay. They went uptown, had a good old time, because uptown was the place to be. Jim puts me in the stroller, and down we go to Clappens, which at that time was Dozens. I don't know if you remember that. And they come home, no Jim, no little Jim in the stroller, and no Bill. And my dad goes, that's that goddamn brother, he's down the joint. Down he goes. There's my Uncle Jim drunk. There's my little brother Bill, he's about a year, maybe a year and a half, behind a bar with a Pepsi or something, just had free reign of the place. I'm in my stroller on the bar, and there's two drunk guys there at each end of the bar, and they're taking turns freewheeling me down the bar. One guy would push, the guy at the other end of the bar would catch me, and he turned me around, and, he, and I'm going, wee, having a great old time. So that was the first time I, I don't remember it, but I was in the bar, and we used to hang there all the time, him and I, and uh, by that time, Jim Hill owned the place. It went Dozen's, Wet Lake's Corner, Jim Hill's, and then uh, Clappett's Corner. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, we, we, yeah, we, st we played there all the time, in and out of the bar. And behind the bar, there was an Orange Crush cooler, just like those Coca-Cola chest coolers and that. And I think Jim kept uh, just blocks of ice in there. So Dan Sullivan, who invented most of these games, invented Orange Crunch. Now behind the bar, and Bob Lee's store was right next door, now it's all incorporated into one on the ground floor, you could go all the way across the back. Bob had an addition put on there when, in the 60s or something, for more storage for his little mom and pop. But you go all the way in the back. So the rules were simple. If you were it, you had to stand on the Orange Crush can or chest. And then the rest of us would go hide. But you had to hide in that little space behind the bar. There was no place to hide. You know, the one place you could hide was uh, the outside entrance to the bar's basement where they delivered the beer. But that's why Dan Sullivan liked the bar, liked the game, because you can tell from that picture there, he was way taller than the rest of us. And he could reach out and lean against the steps going upstairs, and he could look down in the favorite spot. And all he had to do was call you out. You know, Jim's hiding down there, and I'm hiding over behind the boxes behind Bob Lee's door. Just the stupidest game. And then you were it, until he collected everybody. Then somebody else had to be it. And everybody hid in this little space. The little space was big enough to have a small two-car garage which it did, so there was no place to hide. But we played that stupid game for hours. The, ne the next two games, and I think they were played in different areas around Butte, were, were two, and I, we should define where we usually played these is, is on the corner of 2nd and Emma, right by, right by the bar, because we could uh, kick the can and kick the stick. So the stop sign, was there, so you could always lean the stick. It was that one, uh, kick the stick in the soccer ball. Well, we'll do, you'll do the soccer ball step. Oh, okay, but we didn't play kick the can. <laughs> okay, I, I correct it, we didn't play kick the can. Kick the stick, because we could lean the stick up, but the, the sewers were the bases. So so we had each corner, and once, once, and you'd kick the stick, and somebody would catch it, and you could also, you'd have to take them out with, with the stick. So <laughs> kick the stick. Because we didn't have a wall. <laughs> so then, do you, do you want to do pick the... Yeah, I can do that one. Okay, and th this was a, a, a similar game, but you could play on that corner in, in the evening because it, the arc light was there, and the traffic, you just have to wait for the traffic, there'd be kids standing on all the, the sewers waiting for the traffic to go by to continue the game. And then, Dan, Dusty, invented another game called soccer ball. Now we never knew that there was a real game called soccer. We never heard of it. But this was called soccer ball because he invented it. Like I said, we very rarely had a ball or anything. So he made a ball, or his mother did, out of old socks. And filled a sock full of old socks, wrapped it up and put some stitches in it, and it was a ball. Well. 
the way you would play it was on that same corner, and baseball rules applied. And you would pitch underhand the sock, and then you would suck it with your hand. That was the bat. And then from there on, it was baseball, except for the fact because it was a soft sock. You could hit the guy if you could hit him between bases, then he was out. So you could throw the sock at him. And we'd play that for hours. And then one time, I forget when it was, I believe it was in high school, I discovered that there was actually a worldwide sport called soccer. I never heard of it. I thought that was soccer. Hit the, hit the sock with your hand. Different rules. Yeah. yeah. What intersection did you play that at? Huh? What intersection did you play that at? Second and Emma. Check, check right it, where check it. Corner. Right where Clapton's corner. There's a, still a stop sign. It's still a stop, full four-way stop there. There's the storm sewers yeah. on each corner. Sure. You know, so they were kind of long base paths. You'd be pretty busy now. You wouldn't be, huh? wouldn't be able to do that so well now. It, did, it, did, it was as, just as busy then. It it <laughs> yeah. In fact, my brother got run over down there. <laughs> yeah. so funny. He, he was still trying to make the base, though. You gotta, you gotta give him. Uh, I'll oh, kick the can. I think that's pretty well known around around the community. Everybody played that in different areas of the thing. Do you remember how we did that? You, you couldn't tag him out with the can, though. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't tag him out with the can. No, <laughs> but then you'd have to run the bases. Yeah, oh yeah. He yeah. just had to go high. And, and, and so one of, one of our local games was uh, during in the two railroads uh, in that neighborhood, there was always uh, transients moving between the two railroads, between the, the Great Northern and uh, the Union Pacific and the Northern Pacific Railroads, because you know you could get it from that neighborhood, you could head anywhere in the country. Hmm. And so, as the kids up there, and there, there was always transients moving between the areas. My grandmother used to feed what we called them. All. We called them bums, but there was and also a couple camps that. And since uh, our adults, they belonged to clubs, so we formed a club one summer. It was called the Ancient Order of the Bum Runners. <laughs> and, and, and what we did in those days, you know, and now everything's in containers and they just put them on the car, but everybody remembers everything was shipped in boxcars. Well, all the empty cars, the doors would be open, and that's where the bums would ride in those boxcars. So we'd, we'd get about six or seven rocks, each of us, about eight kids, and then you get at an angle to the car and you fire about five rocks in one way, beat every kid would throw at the same time, you'd run to the other side, and, and then some of the bums would get out and go the other way, but some of them would say, hey, you little SOB, and they'd start chasing you, so you had to be fast to be a member of the ancient order of the bum runners, that was in order to survive. And, and, <laughs> there was a variation at this time of the year. You would go up there with firecrackers, and then you maybe take a nap or something, and you light a whole package, throw it inside, and run. And fireworks would go off all over the place. And these guys take a little nap, and all of a sudden the place is exploding. Oh, and we had one. Excuse me. Had one more instance. This was kind of mean. And it wasn't us. It was the older kids. And uh, one was the former sheriff, Rock Cunningham, and his friend uh, Squeaks Bankovich. They grew up down there, and they're about ten years older than us. And he told me they were Fourth of July, or this area, and they're going down Harrison Avenue, walking, and they get to the uh, where Front Street turns into Harrison, and then there's oops, the overpass down there for the railroad. And if you've, you've all seen it, the <coughs> uprights have arched. It's concrete and they're arched. Well, there's some guy drunk taking a nap in there. Squeak goes over, sticks a firecracker in his ear and lights, and they ran off. Now, that was a little bit over the top. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the other game that we had, as we described, we had uh, uh, 
Hall Lumber Company up there, so and, and you want to do shingles? Okay, now, we were playing on this mine dump right here. That's my house over there. And that was the sandwich mine. And it's right on 2nd and Atlantic. It's gone now. It cleaned up. Okay, the sandwich was here, and right in there was the uh, other mine. It's right across the street. Uh, the green copper. The green copper, and they're both gone. So, this game that we're, he's going to explain here now. Right there, it says Roman Peck Lumber, and way back, I don't know if anybody remembers, it was Hall Lumber. Okay, and that's where we got our, our ammo, which is shingles. <laughs> and we would just go right up in here. That was all the oh, <laughs> That's why I'm not touching that thing. <laughs> That's a different we, we would go over there, and Jim Daly knows what we're talking about. We would get starter shingles. They were only about that wide, and they're about that long. And if you bent them and cut them up into fours, you can make our ammo. And that's what we go get. So the shingles, you, you could fly these shingles and pretty something soon... Something like a flat frisbee. Something like a flat frisbee and there'd be shingles all over the dump. But we would never go pick up the old shingles. What we would do is just go get another pack of shingles and, yeah. and, and, we, and we had unlimited supply. There and steal another pack of brand new shingles. Okay, what are you going to do next? Uh, okay. That was, a, this was kind of a, everybody did this, water balloons, you know, threw them at each other, or unsuspecting people. So me and this clown were in my yard, and straight across the street was this old spinster teacher. I don't know if you would even remember that, because we're still young then, and her name was Olga Konarski, and she hated every kid in the neighborhood, especially us. <laughs> so we're out in the yard one day, and Olga's over there painting, and the house is still there, right across the street from Daly's house. Do you remember Olga? Oh, yeah. 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 So anyway, she's painting her deck, her, her front porch, <laughs> and was using a, an oil-based paint, not a water-based paint. So we run the house, make a couple of water balloons. And we're standing on the edge between my house and Daly's house. And my dad's mowing the front yard, but he's over on the south side and can't see us. So we let loose with three or four balloons, a couple each at least. And they were perfect. They hit her, the others hit the banister. They went all over the freshly painted uh, porch. She, come, she was kneeling on the steps. I'm reaching in, just finishing. And she went ballistic. And she starts yelling at my dad, those goddamn kids are throwing water balloons and they're not going on and on and on. We hot-footed out the back door. They were out the backyard and went by that picture you saw of me and my brother through Clappin's yard, went over to the green copper mine and stood up on the mine dump where we could see her house and made fun of her. And my dad comes over to the north side of the house and looks like nobody there. And he looks over at Olga and he says, You goddamn fool, you're getting crazier the older you get. There's nobody over here. And so she were over there making faces and yelling at her. And then she started, They're over on the mine note, they're over. Oh, for Christ's sake, go back in the house and shut up. <laughs> he chews her up. We were on the page. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and one, one of the things we were fairly uh, uh, financially secure, we had, had paper routes at the time, and as we got older, we actually sent away, for this time of year was a big time in the neighborhood, because and I think everybody in Butte loves fireworks, at least in our neighborhood and other neighborhoods, everybody loved fireworks. So, so as young, we would send away a month ahead of time and get these big, sets of all noise fireworks. My mother always liked fireworks and my brother we'd set them off out in the front and we'd set a bunch of these noise ones off and my the deal was to watch mom when she started to get mad of all these noise big 
repeaters that she didn't like, then what you do is you get a couple of sparkler ones and big fountains out there, and then you'd shoot those fountains, and she loved those fountains, so you'd, you'd get her settled down. But we would take the we would take the fireworks ourselves and use them, and uh, as uh, you know, you're free, you're free to create anything you want. So uh, what we would do is great. We would learn to tamp them down because they would shoot farther if you tamped them down harder, and then. You could tip them and angle them, and then you could shoot them, and they would be like and the other, like, like missiles. <laughs> well, they were called two-shot repeaters, and I don't know which one of us or my brother figured out that if you pushed them down into the tube, and it was just a great big firecracker, and when it went off to shoot it up near, it lit the firecracker with a real short fuse, and it got up there 30, 40 feet and blew up with a tremendous explosion. Well, we figured out that if you squished it together, then the, the compression chamber got tighter and it went even higher. Well, then we figured out if you tilted it, like he said, put a rock under it, you had a little cannon. <laughs> so then you could shoot it like you see the neighbor's dog was. There was dogs all over the place back then. Maybe he's walking on the street, so you try and aim it somewhere near him. I just scare the hell out of me and go running off. Sometimes we even tried to shoot the cars going down Second Street. Oh, uh, the other, let's see, we did uh, the fireworks. Oh, no, these were good. Oh, those, those were the ones that were good. <laughs> well, we, there, and there was a variety of fireworks in the pack. And, uh, oh, I think, uh, Okay, two of them didn't come in the pack, you had to get them here. One was torpedoes, and one was M.A.s. Is it, you remember, let me see you shaking your head, you remember M.A.s? Okay, now M.A.s originated with the military, and I didn't find this out till I was in basic training. You'd be going through the uh, obstacle course, some of you probably did this, and then the sergeants would have uh, a few of them, you know, pocket full. They'd light them off, and they were to simulate grenades, and they just about had grenade power. And I'm down in uh, Fort Ord, out on the beach, and uh, going underneath the, the barbed wire, and they're shooting real live, and every, you know, they did this for practice, real live machine guns over your head, so you better stay down. Well, then this guy's throwing M-80s at you. And they would go off with power. So there was a man named Lou Mihalich. He taught boxing, lived out on the east side out there. And uh, he always ran a uh, firecracker stand this time of year. And he had an inn to get these somewhere. They were totally illegal. But we just loved them because they would <clears throat> they'd blow anything up, you know. And I know if you were coming up at that age. If you take your regular firecrackers like a soup can or a, some open can and put a zebra firecracker under there and drop the can over it, see how high you can blow it up in the air. But when it comes to M80s, you would try and get something as big as a uh, coffee can. But you'd never blow it up in the air. It would blow it apart like a grenade. There'd be pieces of tin flying. It would just rip it apart and blow it up, they were so powerful. And we were throwing them at everybody and, you know, just, uh, you didn't want to get hit by it, it'd take your fingers off, you know. So then the other thing we had was torpedoes. Does anybody remember torpedoes? Yeah. Well, they were little round silver balls, looked like paper mache in a way with the silver paint. No fuses or anything, but they went off on contact. You know, uh, today I'm sure they're totally illegal, if you can find any. Well, we'd buy them by the box. And when we first got them, we would just take them and throw them right down in front of you and they'd go off. But then we found out all you had to do was throw them. And as far as you could throw them, when they hit, they'd go off like a little grenade. Well, that wasn't good enough. So we go in the house and we get our whammo slingshots. Now you can put them two blocks down the street. So we'd stand up at my house, 
in front of the house on Emma Street and shoot them kitty corner over all the houses all the way down to the scoop bar. So on, we were always just, we couldn't see what was going on. But we just could imagine that people getting out of their cars, walking over to the scoop, and then from out of the blues, they wouldn't know they were even coming or see them. All of a sudden, they'd blow up. Maybe they'd hit another car. Oh, maybe they'd hit another car. Oh yeah, can you show? The scoop is down here. Yeah. You're shooting them from up here. Up there. <laughs> yeah. And you know, they had no idea. We're just guessing the right trajectory and just laughing because we knew somebody was getting out of their car. But it might have hit their car. It might have hit the house. We, we just shot it. So then... How old were you then? Oh, 24, 25. <laughs> no. <laughs> 14, 15, right around in there. And we'd get these $10 all-noise assortments, like he said. Everything blew up. There was no sparkles, no fire. Everything exploded. <laughs> So then, I don't know which one of us gets credit for this, but we go up top, take a pocket full of them, and our whammos. Then we go, I still remember going down Main, and you'd come down by the Rex bar, and down below, and there's a parking lot there now, but it was the 101, right on the corner there. So one of us, like me, or him, or whoever we're with, maybe John was with us, I don't know. We walked down, one guy had the whammo, and he put a, torpedo in it. And the other guy walk on the sidewalk, and this first guy would be out in the street always. And you'd run over, and you'd grab the door, and you'd open it up. He'd let it fly through the door, this grenade. And you'd slam the door, and we'd run like hell. We never did know where it hit, but as soon as it hit something, it blew up. We just thought that was funnier than hell. How we didn't get killed for that one. Whammo slingshots were, were not a good invention for us. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they, were, they were very powerful and very... Uh, some of the uh, more um, genteel, maybe, things that we did, and I think everybody did this in Butte, is uh, run through the hose. I mean, everybody had hoses. There was a picture up here. And, and, and starting about this time of year, hopefully when it was warmer than this, and uh, we, in my family, couldn't run through the hose. They wouldn't let us run through the hose unless the temperature was 70 degrees. That was kind of, if you were going to run through the hose in our backyard, uh, my, they, my mother looked at the thermometer, and if it was 70 degrees, you were good to go. And you'd, you'd do that for hours, too. Yeah. And it was great, great. They had a great time. big backyard. The other invention that wasn't good for us as a, as a neighborhood, and did, this was a, they didn't last, you never owned one for very long because you just got in too much trouble with it. It was a BB gun. <laughs> and the BB gun was never good. And, and Jim will have his story. And, and, and everybody wanted one. Everybody wanted the Daisy BB gun because you could cock it and shoot it. And the, uh, so my brother, my older brother Joe, got a BB gun. It lasted about four days. Shot some neighbor, got the BB gun taken away, sold. That was the end of the BB gun. Never, every time I mentioned a BB gun, no, remember what your brother did with the BB gun. You don't have, get to have a BB gun. But then, somebody else got a BB gun. <laughs> the same way we were on the Daisy Red Rider BB gun. And, uh, now where we live, me and Jim, right over the street there on Short Street, the Wet Lakes lived there. And they, they at one time, oh, I got another story about that too. They at one time ran the bar. So anyway, Fran Wet Lake is about 10 years older than me, I think. And he was selling his BB gun. I had a chance to buy it. And I had to, I think I had to scrounge up 10 bucks, which is a lot of money. So I bought it. So back we go to Olga's house that I already told you about. Go down the alley and shoot her kitchen window up. This is about two days after I got the gun. She doesn't see us. Finds a BB hole in her window right over to my dad. Those goddamn kids. Well, he knew we did it. <laughs> my mom gets a hold of me and says, take that gun back to Wedlake and give it back. 
I had to go give it back. He kept the ten dollars, but that was my punishment. He he got the money and the ten bucks. Got to sell it again. Uh, and not, another thing, and I think some other people around the community, every everybody was into this in the winter time. At least in our generation, was hooking cars in the winter. They didn't sand the streets. And our, our great advantage is on that very corner, it's a four-way stop. So you wait and you can hide behind uh, the, the, there and just wait till somebody stopped and you either hook a car. And if you were going uptown in the winter time, you would hook the bus. And, and the, hooking the bus, there might be five kids on the back of that bus. <laughs> you, you, had to, it, you had to run across Utah, because Utah was cut sometimes bare. So when he went across Utah, and I think the bus drivers purposely would drive, try to drive fast across there so they could get rid of it. And then when you get uptown, you'd get off. You'd, you'd get off. And every once in a while, you'd, you remember this, when you get off, the, the bump is real tight. You had to get your fingers in behind there. But you'd look at the buses going around town. Here'd be a glove here and a glove there. <laughs> sticking out of, sticking out of, uh, in the Okay, so I'm just, this last one's our best ever, and I'll bet none of you this did was, this or even heard of it. So, so right there was a warehouse. So right but, there is the sandwich mine, and that's on the corner, right across the street from Copper Beacon Park, on the corner of Atlantic and Second. That was our play, though. Oh, we got to do the other thing about going down. But anyway, that was our play, though. Okay, this was Shiner's Warehouse. For those of you that don't know, Shiner's was a big furniture store uptown where the Exer Dance building is now that's being remodeled or I don't know what the hell they're doing with it. They made a mess of it. <laughs> so they had a whole furniture warehouse down here. And that was there, right there. there. I pulled it up. Mm. Huh? Yeah, I pulled it up for you. Right there. Oh, right yeah, right there. And this was the hall number. It says Roland Peck, and it was Roland Peck later. So anyway, that's where that was. So so we would wait, and, and, and when they would deliver, they go to deliver refrigerators. Refrigerators came in the box. The, like the sofas. And, and they would, they would, the boxes, you know, the, the warehouse guy had to get rid of it. So they put just put the box outside the warehouse, and we would watch and watch for those boxes. And every time there was a boxer, the guy was probably thrilled because they all disappeared as soon as they went out there. Well, and we get the bigger one, the big the couch box, so that we can get inside of it. So, so we get the couch box. We get one or two guys, preferably two, and they crawl down to one end, and the, then the sealed end, the sealed end where it was hard to get out, and then. The other guy would pack the other end, maybe put some weeds up and light the other end on fire. He pulled, yeah, he pulled it like he's a box, an empty box. And then light her on fire. And if we were really lucky, we swiped from somebody's parents, we'd swipe a can of lighter fluid so we could really get it going. So him and I get in, and somebody like this clown down here. Maybe Neil McCumber might have been the one, or Jim Seymour, or my brother, or his brother. And they'd light the other side of the box, the open side, on fire. Now, being brave little nutty kids, you didn't kick your way out the end. You waited till you couldn't wait anymore. And that thing would be blazing, because you had to be brave or something. Then you would kick your way out the sealed end before you burnt it. We just thought that was funnier than that. And, 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 and that was a. That was, it was, it wasn't a one-time event, it was we watched for those boxes all the time. We love to do that. And, and you know, the one thing that I was thinking about this and Johnny Gillespie in, in high school is, I mean, uh, we were older and it isn't, it, that was our neighborhood, but Johnny Gillespie when he started running out high school, we could practically do another thing. But I have to mention the one thing, Johnny lived down by where the, Milwaukee Railroad went through, and he had an uncle who had a horse there, and so, you know, Johnny and I would ride the horse, and this is cowboy and Indian time, you know, this is, 
what you do. So what, one guy, it was bareback, and one guy had the reins. We didn't have to have a saddle. So one guy would be up front. And then the train would be going by. This time, the train was running. And we'd gallop next to that train, and the guy in the back would jump off on the train, and the train would be going, the horse would go out, then you'd come back and you'd jump back on the horse. So Johnny's on the front, he's got the reins one time, and he's driving, going down the thing, and I'm going to jump off. Well, all of a sudden, I look, Johnny jumped on the train. He's gone. Now, the horse is still running next to the train. The reins are hanging down, and I'm there bouncing off the, the car like this as the horse starts turning away and, and fall off it. He thought that was the funniest idea. So that's just an extra one that, as you got older, this, did, this didn't stop. And, and one of the things I would like to bring up, I mean, some of this sounds crazy. All but of it sounds crazy. <laughs> But, but to, to me, it's kind of around the Butte neighborhoods, these things were going on, and even at the earlier times, you know, I think it's kind of made Butte people go up to be what they were, is first you were, you, you wanted to succeed, you learned to get along, you learned to read people, you learned to work together, you learned who was with you and who was against you. You learn not to tattle, you couldn't go to your parents over this stuff. You learned all those things. Then when you went out into life, I think you brought those lessons with you. If you take a look at it, you were successful whether you were in the trades, whether you were a teacher, because you learned these lessons throughout your life. If you take a look at the generation there, and you look at the people, they brought these games that they played in Butte into their work lives and into the, I think, the ethics that they did. And the next thing we did, at least for me, is we sure knew that our kids weren't going to do any of this stuff because we were trained. <laughs> We'd, already come in. We'd already been there and we didn't want that happening again. I would just we, like to say the reason I brought up the speeding tickets and everything, is that the only the only legal record I found on these two. They didn't get arrested or picked up or put in the hospital. They have all of their fingers. I don't know about their toes, but. Wrong. But. We got put in the hospital. You got, well. Because of that guy right there. Uh -oh. uh, we, were, we were older this time. Okay. And this is funny. Uh -oh. We go over to the state track meet because we were, I don't think we we're still in high school, but just right out of but uh, not legal age yet. So we go over to the state track meet in Missoula. Of course, we get drunk. Me and him and Gus Hernandez, and we're staying at this motel. And they were inside the motel, and I forget why I was out, and these kids from Missoula pulled up. And I'm standing there, and the guy looking for instructions, and he looks at me, and he says, hey, punk. And I said, what? Hey, punk. He says, where is such? I said, what did you call me? And he said, punk. I said, get out. So we get in a fight. So there's him and his three buddies, and I'm getting my butt kicked, which usually happened. I go in and said, I told him, wait a minute, wait just a minute. And I go in to see these guys that are inside the room, him and Gus. And I walk in, I'm all dirty, because I've been rolling around the parking lot. And he told me later, he says, I thought you were out there changing the tire on the car or something, because you're all dirty. I said, I need you guys out there, I need some help. And he thought, help change it up. So they walk out with me, and these guys jump out of the car and they say, good, there's more of them. These two guys went crazy. He grabs the first guy, he's beating the Jesus out of this guy. Gus chases the second guy, he ran across the parking lot, tackled him, and if he knocked him out, he beat the hell out of him. He gets through beating his guy up. Gus comes running back, and the guys crawl into his car. <laughs> Gus drop kicks him in the chest. I thought he killed him. They just put him out. So then we get in the car, and they took off. They got in the car. So then we got to go find him. So I do want to beat on the sports. We go downtown by the, uh, what was that, the palace? Is that the, and there was a mixer of dancing. So we're parked kitty corner from the hotel. So we're heading down that way, and, and John and Gus went this way, the hotel's over here. They took, and I don't know why I went the other way. And then I was crossing the street, and they were crossing over that way. 
Well, I go across the street, I wait for the light and everything, it changes color. I got the green. I look to my left, nobody's coming. Look to my straight ahead and go across. Meanwhile, this kid from Great Falls has picked up some girls and they're a good old time like us. They went through the intersection. And they yelled at him, he was supposed to take a left right there. He slams on the brake, throws in the reverse and stomps on it. I walk out, I'm looking this way, he hits me from this side. I come down, hit my chin, I still got the scar, break my jaw, knock four teeth out, knock myself out. These two come running over. In the meantime, just for law and order, there was a cop stand on the corner. And he comes over. And these two come over. And Gus grabs the, the driver. And he's beating them half to death. The cop comes over and pulls him off. And he said, I got it, kid. I got it. And he's yelling. He ran over my buddy. And he says, I know. We got the ambulance coming. Everything's under control. I got it. He leaves Gus go. Gus goes back, beats the guy up again. Cop pulls him off. I told you now, don't do anything. I know you're excited, but just calm down. He leaves him go. Gus goes back to beat him up again. The cop comes and grabs him the third time. Gus beats up the cop. And Gus heads for jail. Here comes the meat wagon. I, I remember stepping off the curb. The next thing I remember is I'm riding in the back of the ambulance to the hospital. He has to go back. We're staying at his aunt's house. He goes back all by himself. And this is a typical view thing. He walks in, his aunt says, what was that aunt's name? I can't remember. Marty. Marty, yeah. Walks in and she says, where's Gus and Jim? This is at nighttime now. We've been gone all day. And he says, well, Jim's in the hospital and Gus is in jail. <laughs> Just, and she, she went nuts. What? Their mother's gonna kill me. Just walks in casual. Oh, Jim's in the hospital and Gus is in jail. <laughs> Another typical night with the good guys. So we'd open, like to open it up for other stories if people have other stories and uh, of neighborhoods or things that they did in the neighborhood. Did you have any other different games that were, you know, Jim McCarthy, you grew up on the west side. Did you play anything like Firebox? We never played Firebox. Ladies, did you? what did you do with the big boxes? My dad yeah, built me a house with a house. house. You oh. cut a door and windows in it. You, know, you would get two people in it and you'd roll down the mine hills. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you're related to him. <laughs> <laughs> I would so. like to tell you, though, <laughs> The 4th of July pyromania stuff, that lasted well until their 30s. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's lasted into his 80s. <laughs> well, then I initiated my grandkids, and they're about as bad. Oh, they yeah. just don't have the real good stuff, the M80s and things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they taught us to take the um, pop cans were different back then. You could take the bottom off. Or you take, you take the top off soup cans. Keep the bottom, yeah. Yeah. or soup cans. But the um, we liked the uh, pop cans because they were aluminum and lighter. Mm -hmm. And you put a hole in, you take the top off so that's completely open, turn it upside down, put a hole in the bottom just big enough for a firecracker, put the firecracker in until it was just going to be about this much above the water because you had a bowl of, or like a tub of water and it was filled up like, you know, four or five inches, and then you put the can in, and then you like the firecracker and watch the can go up. They taught us that. That yeah. was one of their the easier things. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I do have one more. Uh, uh, I see uh, uh, Sue Yule and Sue Robin Juleman is here, and, and there, there's, there's one good story is when I, I'm older and I had a boat and became good friends with her dad and they had a place up at uh, Georgetown Lake and so I'm up there with her dad and it's, it's kind of the early part of the year it's it's like uh, March and he said look the lake's low and he said look at all these stumps you have to you have to dodge these stumps coming in here and uh, and gee I wonder if we could pull any of those out of there so anyway I had this old kind of vehicle and Leo Ugrin, his brother, 
And I went up and we pulled one of these stumps out and half of it, it, it was just heavy and we tried to get rid of it. And it, it took us a whole day to get half of one of these stumps out. So Leo was working at the high or at the time. And so we said, uh, so Leo, Leo comes home with a case of dynamite. So anyway, he comes home with some dynamite and fuses. So we go up there during the week up to Georgetown and and we take and there's about eight or ten stumps out there and so we started with a couple sticks and, and I got I got videos of this an old camera I had I took pictures of this. So we'd we'd light it and we'd shoot it, we'd light behind the house and it'd go out and you'd see all the stuff going out in the bay. There's not many people around. Well there's about a half a case of powder left and there's a big huge stump. And I said, well, let's let's maybe put four sticks on her. Leo said, let's just stick the rest of the got rid of this stuff anyway. So we stick the whole pile of powder under there. And it blows, and we're thrilled. This thing goes halfway across that, that bay down at the end, and it's plunking around out there. So anyway, I go back the next week, and I'm up there, and Red Robbins comes running out. He says, did you tell anybody you were up here? I said, no. He said, anybody know you were up here? I said, well, just Leo and I. What's the matter? He said, well, I'll tell you what happened. He said, Bud Gelling, who lived six cabins down the way, came up and said, uh, Red, come here, I want to show you something. And they walked down, and in his boathouse, there was a big hole for the roof of the boathouse and a big stump sitting next to his boat. <laughs> said don't tell us but you were up. But there was no stumps left in the bay going to the Robin's house, I'll tell you that. Does anybody, else, does anybody else have any questions or stories or they want to refute anything these guys said? Well, there's, just one, there's one more thing. I, your sister, Kitty, when I would I was at your house a lot. She and Mary Downey and I were out. We used to run around because it was safe to run around even as a girl in that neighborhood. And so one night they wanted to show me a game. They, they would take tires. We took tires and we'd go to the bars and roll them into the roll of the tire into the bar and run. You know, for us that was great sport. And I can remember running between those old brick buildings. I mean, we had no fear, you know, of anybody between the buildings or. You know, yeah. I think of, of, you couldn't do it today, could you? No. <laughs> <laughs> One other quick story about being crazy was him, not me. And over at the sandwich mine that uh, I was talking about, yeah. back when they had the head frames, and she showed a quick picture of me and my brother and Kate Clapp, and you could see those mines in the background, and they had the wooden uh, head frames, which they tore down. We go over, and the one, at the sandwich on Atlantic, and we pulled some of the boards off of it, covered the shaft. Now, I didn't go with them this time, but I think him and my, my brother, or his brother, they went down the ladder, and it was just a rickety old ladder. And then you're going down the ladder like here, and you get down 40, 50 feet, it was that, and there's a drift going out towards the uh, the diggings, as we call it, where the food bank is now. So they go down, jump across the shaft. We don't know how deep it was. Because you got down that far, the water was up to that height. And they go exploring in the drift. I went later. I wasn't with them that day. And I just got down enough to see the drift. And I got the hell out of there. Because this wooden ladder had to be 100 years old. And so he said he went in the drift and he could tell it. Well, well, the thing that well, you were kind of scared going down, but then when you when you got you had to jump across to get the drift, and then you, you had to get things. You're going, I'm going to have to get back there. And then when you got in the drift, we just had little flashlights, and and all of a sudden you got in there and you said, this, you know, this we shouldn't be in. A ball drift, no timbers. No timbers, it was just, it was just, it was no, the hole. just a hole that they were exploring. And, and, uh, it, it's, and, and it reminds me of one other story when we were in high school. Johnny Gillespie and I were down by his house digging a tunnel, and his dad said, Oh, I can show you how to 
make that work. And all of a sudden his dad went, no, no I'm not going to show it. <laughs> One other tunnel story, well, this is really stupid. If you were, oops, oh, it, I don't know. You're going to show your shot. No, I'm not. Here, I'll do it. I can show you something on this. Which slide do you want? Uh, the map. You yeah. can do this one today. Yeah. You can do See this right here is Hampton Park, Copper Vico Park. Yeah. Okay, this is what we call the digging. And at one time, there was just an open sewer round through there, like a little creek. And it brought all the wastewater from all of the laundries were, big laundries were up on the east side. And they come down, somehow they got under the railroad tracks, I guess a sewer of kind. And then they hit up, hit up here, oh shoot. And they come down, and somewhere in here they went underground again, all the way down to here. Then they come out and they went over to here where the school bus barns and the old Eddie's bread is there. And they went down an open creek again, all the way down the Silver Bowl. Well, later on they put it, uh, regular sewer in there. And right down there, you get into the sewer. I don't know how we did, why we did this, but because we're nuts. We took the sewer lid off and went down there. Well, then we found out we'd go this way. So we would walk in the sewer all the way up to the Silver Bowl homes. Just because we could. Now, there's not much in a sewer, I'll tell you. That's, that's attractive. But we would go up anyway. Well, Jim and Jim, thank you so much. That's okay. I don't care. I don't think they care. Nobody left. Nobody left. Lots of laughs. I don't know if anybody believes the see. Hold up your finger. They all have, they still have their fingers, right? Yeah. Living with these guys, none of these oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Speaking of that, <laughs> eh? except for him. <laughs>